I started last Sunday, and while I'm very conscious of the fact that today is Palm Sunday, I want you to understand that most of the time, my messages are not dictated by the calendar. So I really intended to get the message on identity, uh, pr uh, uh, protecting your identity, completed last Sunday, and that didn't happen. So I'm going to go for it again today. Now. Um, I think that I've done an adequate job of sharing my heart as it relates to Resurrection Sunday. Um, my heart is it's got nothing to do with Easter bunnies and nothing to do with egg hunts. And if that's your goal, I mean this with all due respect, then you're probably not going to have a whole lot of fun and no excuses come this coming Sunday. Because we're, we're pressing for uh, life change and eternity change. That's, that's, that's the press. And so I'm not using bunny rabbits and colored eggs to do it. Now, I, I still want to make the event fun and have some photo ops and, and things for people to enjoy. So I'm working on getting some pinatas to hang in the gym. Some for the, some for the, the mijos <laughs> and some for, the, some for the bigger ones and some, <laughs> and some for the... Some of the big kids. So um, I I'm working on some details with that. Uh, hopefully Carrie's going to really help me out with that. She's the artistic one. So, um, so we'll, have some, we'll have some stuff to do that'll, that'll be fun and enjoyable that you can look forward to without, uh, without running through the weeds to pick up eggs. Okay? So if you have your Bibles, I want to see if I can wrap up uh, protection of your identity I, I got to page four on Sunday, which was, in hindsight, pretty good. Um, and the, the first point that I addressed uh, on the way to completion here was Jesus' identity being confirmed. And without going back and re-preaching that, uh, Jesus' identity was known to all when he came up out of the baptism waters and the Lord spoke from the clouds and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I can imagine 
that if we pulled the baptistry tank out and baptized some of you and we hear a clap from heaven that says, you're my son or you're my daughter and I'm pleased with you, I don't think anybody in the house would question whether or not God was pleased with them. And so the, the father really set Jesus up to let him, to let him be known among all those in that, in that region, hey, my hand is upon him. And so that was a great launching pad, if you will, for his identity to be um, inaugurated, if I can use that term. And so I want to move now into his identity being challenged. How many of you have been honestly saved? And listen, I don't mean prayed the prayer. I mean, you have had a conversion experience that the, the old man died and, and everything on the inside became new, okay? You've had that kind of encounter with God. Let me see those hands. Okay. It's important that I see that and that you acknowledge that because if it hasn't happened yet, as I know it's happened many times already, it's going to happen again that your identity is going to be challenged. And I wish I could say that we had a high success rate for people winning that battle in knowing who they are. And I think we all start well, but not so many are finishing well. So Jesus' identity is about to be challenged, and you guessed it, who's going to challenge him? The accuser. And so we see the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. He's not only challenging the identity of Jesus, but he's also challenging our identity in Jesus. So Luke 4, chapter, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, full of the Holy Spirit. That's important. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. So let me tell you where the enemy wants to challenge your identity. He wants to do it while you're in the desert. He wants it when you're by yourself, when you don't have, you know, uh, McDonald's around the corner. He, he wants you isolated by yourself in a deserted place where you feel spiritually dry and emotionally depleted. Can I just say this? I've learned that that doesn't always happen simultaneously. There's sometimes I've felt spiritually dry, but emotionally okay. And sometimes I've felt spiritually okay and emotionally dry. But when, that, when, that, when those two hands come across on that clock where you're both spiritually dry and emotionally dry, which can happen at the same time, that's even a more dangerous situation to be in. And I, I need you to hear this. One of the ways, this is a sidebar for my notes, one of the ways that the enemy wants to see to it that you're in the desert is he wants to keep you away from the water of God's word and the fount that is his house and his people. I have found that when I'm in a bad way, in a bad zone, if I can get a hold of some people that I know love Jesus more than they love me, they will detect that there's something not right in my life and say, listen, let me just encourage you with this, or hey, let me challenge you with this, or hey, let me throw this your way because I think you're getting a little bit off track. And that even, even if it stings, even if it hurts when they give it to me, it brings a refreshing and it brings life. We tend to run from the things that are painful or, dis, or, or, or disheartening or, dis, or not comfortable because we've forgotten what's on the other side. We, we dread the ripping of the band-aid coming off more than we do the healing of the wound that it covered. We have gotten in this Western society so caught up in our comfort that if I come to a particular church or under a particular ministry and they make me feel weird or awkward or, or ill at ease or, or uncomfortable, well, I'm just not going back. Can I tell you the gospel is never meant to make you feel comfortable? Comfort is not in the Scripture. In fact, comfort will send you straight to hell. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and pff, destruction comes. 
We have people that would rather gather at bedside assembly on any given Sunday or Wednesday or Thursday as it may be than they would to be gathering together in the house of God. That's a problem. Have you noticed that when, when good things are happening and you want to be a part, sleep comes on like a hurricane? Have you noticed that? When, when God wants to do something in your heart, in your life, your body, does the, the enemy doesn't function so well in your spirit like that, so he begins to affect the body. And so we'll blame, oh, well, it was a sugar high. Well, I had a crash. Well, I didn't have enough coffee. Well, I didn't get my energy drink. Well, I didn't get enough rest last night. But, but you're able to stay awake when you're driving. You're able to stay awake when you're having a conversation. You're able to stay awake in the restaurant. You're able to stay awake everywhere until the word of God is being spoken or, or correction from God is coming or, or, or something that's challenging in your spirit and all of a sudden our body goes uh uh tired and goes out we we need listen the bible says don't be ignorant don't be uneducated about the devil's schemes The enemy will come to you when you're in the desert and say things like, you're not really even saved. You don't even feel saved, do you? And if we're not careful, we find ourselves saying, well, as a matter of fact, I, I really don't feel saved. I, explain to me, please, what does being saved feel like? I don't always feel victorious, but I know who I am. I am victorious. I can't go by what I feel. Watch this. It just, when, when the feeling matches what I know in my knower, it's a happy day. When my feelings lie against what my knower is, I have to choose what I know in my knower over what I feel every time. Feelings can lie. He'll say things to you like, oh, well, you know, that was just you. You just had an emotional fit in front of everybody. You just did what you thought everybody else. You know that was a courtesy drop. That wasn't really God. You can't remember the exact day or time that you got saved, can you? Must not have been real. He's got a thousand lines to cause questions in your own mind and in your own heart. You're not really called of God, are you? You're just trying to do it because mom and daddy did it, grandma and grandpa did it, and so and so and such and such did it because, you know, you, you heard a word that came over the internet one day and you felt something in your belly that was really pizza that had nothing to do with God. See, in Luke chapter 4, verse 3, what are the first words that come out of the devil's mouth at Jesus' temptation? He says, if you are the Son of God. <laughs> if, that is a huge word. If is a massive word. Well, of course Jesus is the Son of God. He just came from God splitting the skies and saying, this is my Son. Of course he's the Son of God. But yet in the desert, oh, God help me. In the desert, the enemy is, is questioning Jesus' encounter. He's questioning his experience. He's questioning whether or not he really knows in his knower who he is. See, some of y'all come in here, glory to God, hallelujah, and you get all pins and needles and you hit the floor and you flop like a fish and all kind, you get healed and set free and wonderful things are happening and you leave, you leave out of here when, when you're by yourself. When you're on I-35 and 5 o'clock traffic and you're bumper to bumper and everybody's flipping you off and cutting you off and everything and the devil will reach up on the inside of you and say, you know, when you was at church the other day, you know that was just you. That was emotionalism. They've got you tricked into all this goosebumps and feelings and, and all that. They're manipulating you and you fell for a hook, line, and sinker. You're the same old beast you ever were. You're never going to be anything different than what you are right now. And so you just need to get real with it. That's why sometimes when people walk into this house and I see them and I walk up and say, what's your deal? Well, well, nothing. I, I, I'm fine. Well, really? You need to tell your face. You're not fine. Yeah. Walking in here grousing, looking at the floor, you know, kind of grimacing at people. And you, know, you kind of give off the air, don't touch me, don't look at me. And, and if they do, you kind of grimace at Listen, what's on the inside is bound to come up on the outside. And it's time we stop denying that the enemy likes to mess with us too. God likes to mess with us, but the devil likes to mess with us. you got to know he's always trying to imitate the things of God. 
So when you see something that is contrary to what you know is God on the inside of them, call them out. Otherwise, you are, in, you are absolutely in agreement with the enemy and your silence is agreement. What's the purpose of having brothers and sisters? If you treat church like a family reunion and you come, you, you break bread and you have some fried chicken, but you don't want to talk to them, you don't want to sit with them, you don't want to hug them, you don't want to visit, you don't want to know what's going on in their life, you don't want to tell them what's going on in your life, then all this is is a glorified once a week, twice a week family reunion. There needs to be some fellowshipping going on. There needs to be some invasion of your proverbial privacy. I'm sorry. What, why were you cross-eyed when you came into church? Did you, were you on the sauce this weekend? If you are dumb enough to walk in here zapped, I'm going to be bright enough to call it out. That's, that's not to shame you. That's not to embarrass you. That is to let you know that I care about you. I care where you've been and what you're doing. I care about the infection you're trying to bring into my life, and you need to know that I'm going to infect your life right back in a positive way. Listen, we need to be rubbing off on people. And it ought not be our temperament. It ought not be our bad habits. It ought to be the anointing. We ought to be so full of the Holy Spirit that we're sweating the anointing. Everything that comes out of our mouth ought to be encouraging. And when it's not, we need to have people that love us enough to say, I don't think that was Jesus-like. Because it causes us to check ourselves. That's not a bad thing, guys. You're not going to be perfect from the last day man. This life is a thing that we have, to, we have to deal with day by day by day by day by day. But it's a lot more fun doing it with people instead of running from people that God put you with. It's not my fault God saddled you with me. If you're the son of God. If you really are a believer, if you really are spirit-filled, if you really are, you know, Holy Spirit-led. So the enemy says to Jesus, if you're the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And if you and I are not careful, we're going to fall into the same trap. Jesus was successful in getting out of it, but we might not be so successful if we're not paying attention. Because what we tend to do is we try to attempt to fulfill a legitimate hunger in an illegitimate way. Oh. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. How, how many is hungry right now? You're hungry. Physically hungry. If you go chowing down on saltine crackers, M&Ms, Snicker bars, candy, You're going to get full, but it's an illegitimate full. We got people that are living their entire life on frozen pizzas, cheese sticks, buffalo wings. Watch this. Things that taste good but hurt us. Listen, I don't want to sound anti-church. I'm not. But I want you to know that just because the carnival lights and sounds are out front and it's full of cotton candy and you leave full doesn't mean you have what God had in store for you. We got too many people showing up to get a sugar high so they go, Woo! Wasn't that good? Sometimes I leave going, oh, wasn't that good? <laughs> because the blessing comes on the back end of discipline. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he disciplines, he spanks. He, he does what he has to do. Why? Because a loving father is not going to let nonsense go on and not calling out. But we seem to think that we're representing Jesus by letting all that nonsense happen in the house and never saying anything about it. Well, I didn't want to hurt their feelings. <laughs> I don't want them to miss heaven. I will hurt their feelings to ensure their goal. 
I'm not here to stroke egos. I can't do that and fulfill my mandate. So when we try to fill a legitimate hunger in an illegitimate way, things like adultery, homosexuality, pr pornography, thievery, extortion, all kinds of things can, can wind up being the stopgap to try to fill the hole that's designed to be filled by God. If you're the son of God. Let me put it at you. If you're a son of God. If you're a daughter of God. Then go ahead and cause this, this stone to be made bread. We have too many people trying to prove to others that they're called by God by doing things that God didn't instruct them to do in order to wow the people. Hear me again. Got too many people trying to prove to others that they're anointed and called by God by doing things that God didn't tell them to do in order to earn your respect instead of his approval. I've told you this, and I mean this. I'm not saying this for you to test me. I'm not saying this for God to test me, the devil to test me. I'm saying it because it's my heart. I will deliver and preach the way that I'm preaching if I have five or 5,000. The number does not, is not relevant to me as far as fulfilling what God has told me to do. Now, do I want to present a large body when I get to heaven and say, hey, Daddy, these, all these thousands of people are the result of what you put in me to reach them? Yes, I absolutely want to say that. Is that to make me into something? No, that's, to, that's for me to hear the words from Dad saying, well done, son. <laughs> that's what that's about. That's what that's about. You hear what I'm saying? Verse 5, Luke 4. So the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me. He's not lying. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone that I want to. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. Let me tell you why he wasn't lying. You go back to Genesis all the authority God over the heavens and the earth, God gave to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve gave it to the devil functioning as a serpent. You with me? So he got it. So he, he didn't say how he got it. He just said, all the authority of all these realms has been given to me. That's, that's the truth. And he says to Jesus, I'll give this all to you if you'll bow down and worship me. Now watch the goal here. Jesus knows that what the enemy is willing to hand him is what Jesus came to get a different way. Oh, God, help me today. So what, it, what, it, what the enemy's trying to do is he's trying to subvert the plan of God by handing him what he came for in the first place without having to go to the cross. I ain't grabbing this. We got people that are more interested in having minister so-and-so, pastor, apostle, prophet, evangelist, superman, revivalist, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And they haven't been through the fire. They haven't been tested. They haven't been pressed. They haven't been squished. They haven't, they probably haven't even been called. Because I'm telling you, most people, oh, God help me today. Most people that really wear the saddle of submission from God had to be cornered in the pen, had to have the bit in the bride put in their mouth, had to, had to learn how to deal with the blanket, then had to have a saddle, then had to have God get on them and break their will. This wasn't something that said, oh, Lord, ride me. This was like, leave me alone, God. There's a lot of other people you can go get. Leave me alone. But when you get, uh, when you get ostracized by God, when you get cornered in the pen, when you get that bit in your mouth and you decide, well, I'm going to say what I'm going to He goes, no, you're not. You're, Whoa, yes, sir. No, I'm not. Because my will has been broken. I'm here today as a broken man. I'm here today to do his will, not mine, to say what he once said, not what I want to say. This has nothing to do with scratching an itch in me. This has everything to do with hearing, well done, son, from above. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why you go to church. That's why you win people to Jesus. That's why you do what God tells you to do. That's why you hear from him. Yes. 
well, if you'll just attend our church for six months, we'll give you your own ministry and your own office and a stipend, and you can call yourself the apostle evangelistic so-and-so. That's the equivalent of the enemy saying to the Lord, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you what you came for. You won't have to go through all that mess. You won't have to have your beard plucked out. You won't have to be spit on, kicked. You won't have to be whipped with, with, with all the stripes. You won't have to be pierced. You won't have to be stripped naked in public. You won't have to be hung on a cross. You don't have to go through any of that stuff. Here it is. Just bow. We got people looking for the easy way. Why? Why do you think our society is the way that it is today? Three quick steps to become a millionaire. Three quick steps to shed 50 pounds in seven days. Here's one. Three months on online training to get your ordination. Oh, no, they've, they've upped it. Pay your 50 bucks in the ordination you get. So you got people walking around calling themselves reverend, apostle, pastor, evangelist, so-and-so, and you look them up, and they got a $50 certificate from the Universal Church online. Do you hear anything I'm saying? The enemy is trying to give you what he thinks you want without paying a price. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't honor an ordination that comes for $50 off of the Universal Church website because I don't believe God honors it. I don't want my doctor who's got to, who's got to operate on me to get a $50 certificate from the medical of some Universal Church medical board and say that he's now qualified to cut on my body. Help me, God. See, it was Jesus' destiny that he was going to rule the kingdoms of the world, and he knew how it was going to come about. He knew that the devil that was presenting these kingdoms to him in this instant, and in just a little bit longer, he was going to go visit him in his lair. <laughs> And he's going to say, yeah, all that stuff you offered, I want it now, but after you bow to me. You see what I'm saying? Jesus did not sacrifice the easy way out because he knew that it came with eternal consequences. We need to live our life in the same way. I'm not going to take the easy way out. I'm not going to say what they tell me is the politically correct thing to say. I'm not going to call people what they prefer me to call them. Not doing it. Do you hear where I'm at? This is it. This is it. The enemy has been redefining even our language. There's times that I was doing stuff I shouldn't be doing, and I did it on purpose. The dad had to take a belt off and beat some sense into me that kept me from doing dumb stuff in the future that could have taken my life. But I don't look back on that and say, Dad was hating on me. I don't. I look back now and I recognize it took a lot of love to have to do that because I, I, I know what it takes to have to go discipline kids. Well, I just love my kids so much, I just don't want them in pain. What? Whip them now so that in 10 minutes the pain is over, but they don't go do the things that will take them to hell. How about that? How many in this room wish to God your parents had taken a switch to you to, to change your path? Let me see your hands. Hold it high. Hold it high. Bash will be, look all over the room. Look all over the room. Look all over the room. I guess the rest of y'all were whooped. I'm trying to make this practical so you'll understand. 
if you have to go to the internet and pay $50 to get the ordination that you don't want to pay the price in God to get from him, then what you think is a quick way to get what you want, you really didn't get what you want. You got what the enemy wanted because now you're bound to him. There's a hook in the bait. There's a hook in the bait. Ministry, so I'm told, is like fine wine. It should get better with age, not the age on the shelf, but the age in life. The more you live it, the richer your testimony is. Satan, the current God of this world, was wielding a certain power over the world. And the offer he gave Jesus was ultimately a shortcut to fulfillment. But the legitimate way included the cross. The legitimate way for you to know him is by the cross. I'm skipping. So when he said, if you're the son of God, do this. What's the devil implying? If you don't do it, then you're not the son of God? I mean, that's, that's absolutely what he's implying. He's trying to put Jesus in a vice to do what he wants him to do instead of what God wants him to do. Remember when Jesus said, I only do the things I see and hear my father say and do? That's important. Because if you don't learn that, then people will cause you to do what they want you to do. Well, if you were any kind of pastor, then you would help me with this, this, and this. And if you were, if you were any kind of prophet, then you would, have, you would have recognized the gift that is me and the call that is upon my life. And you'd release me to, you see what I'm saying? So they put the if on there to, to delegitimize God's hand on your life. So if you don't know the voice of God, and if you don't know what is to be led by his spirit, you'll be led by the enemy that shows up in people. The Bible says in Luke 4, 13, when the devil had finished tempting him, he left him until an opportune time. If you look in the Amplified, it says a more opportune time. If you look in the New Living Translation, it says to the next opportune time. In whatever way, shape, or fashion, the devil knew he was getting another shot. And just because you, you seemingly won a particular battle does not mean he's not around the next corner waiting to come at you again, looking for you to be a little weaker, a little farther in the desert, a little more by yourself, a little bit more isolated, a little bit more depressed, a little bit more not joyful, a little bit more alone. He left him for a more opportune time. See, the, that battle was over, but the war was not. So we recognize now, in order to prevent identity theft, we have to know who we are. We have to know our identity. We have to recognize that our identity is absolutely going to be challenged. But not only that, number three, our identity has to be confessed. When Jesus returns from the, that temptation, what does he do? Under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he declares, God, he declares his true identity. You know what that means? That means that Jesus had acquiesced. That means that he had, he had given his right to make the choice to be whatever dad's choice was over him. We got too many people saying, well, I'll serve God if he lets me prophesy over people. You're probably the wrong person to prophesy. Prophesying is a scary thing. Especially when you're giving a word from God and they're sitting there going. That's happened a few times where they've come back sometimes years later. Yeah, you know, 10 years ago when you said, yeah, well, okay, you were right. 
It's not about the fact that I was right. It's the fact that he's not wrong. Revisit that another day. So confessions, or confession, singular, is a part, but not the whole. We have to follow through. <laughs> See, we got a lot of people teaching a doctrine today that says if you just confess, then it doesn't matter how you live. Because you confessed. What is it that we're confessing? <laughs> that I'm worm food and he's king. That I'm desperate and he's loving. I have nothing, he is everything. That's the confession that we're saying. How about you go stand before God and a group of witnesses and you confess your love to your beloved and then when the, when the ceremony's over, you go live any old way that you want to forgetting any confession that you made. That's how a lot of believers are being taught that they can come into the kingdom and we wonder why our churches are empty and why people don't have any knowledge of the word, understanding how the Holy Spirit moves, how, how God talks, if he talks, does he heal, is he still healing today, did the gifts work, did they not work, did it cease with the apostles? They have no clue. Why? Because they made a confession and then they lived the way they were living anyway. If it won't work in a marriage here, it won't work in a marriage there. I don't think that message, that, that line was as popular as what some of the, others were, uh, the, uh, the other lines were. It's not, you guys really do understand I'm not looking for sound bites. I'm grateful that people online can hear what we're saying, but I'm not even preaching for them. I'm preaching to you. Luke 4, 14. Jesus is baptized. He's come up out of the water. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of of the Holy Spirit and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. Verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So let's go back and understand what we just read. Jesus came after his baptism in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 18, he, uh, he confesses the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Watch this. He didn't have a confession without the Spirit of the Lord being upon him. But because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, his confession mattered. <laughs> confession matters when you possess that which you're confessing. If you're, just, if you're just professing what you want to be on your life, that is not a confession. Listen, even the Catholic Church understands something about confession. They go to confessionals. They don't go to confess what you did. They go to confess what they did. So when I come and I'm giving a confession of faith, I'm confessing what God did to me, for me, on me, with me, in me, around me, because of me. I'm in alignment and in agreement with what he is doing and what he has said over my life. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. I've had this question happen on Facebook, and I don't know that it's actually been answered pro appropriately. So let me just say this. People say, well, I want to go because they're anointed. And they think that the anointing is, is what they're after. Let me put it this way. The anointing is the appointing. The anointing is the calling. The anointing is the release of the responsibility to do. You and I are anointed to win the lost. 
but we'll never do it until we're empowered from the Holy Spirit from on high. If you're a believer and you receive Jesus as the Lord of your life, that comes with an anointing, that comes with a calling, that comes with a, with a design for your life. But you'll never fulfill it until you've been empowered from on high. That's why church buildings are filled with professional Christians, professional confessors, professional prayers. Because not everybody that confesses is empowered. So he is anointed to preach. He's anointed to proclaim freedom. He's anointed to release the oppressed. He's anointed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are things that he is called to do. He is appointed to do those things. But he will not fulfill them and did not fulfill them until he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Everyone knew that in Isaiah 61, that that passage was a prediction about the Messiah. Jesus was identifying himself as, I am him. I'm the dude. I'm the one you've been waiting on. I'm the one you've heard about your whole life. It's me. In similar fashion, we need to begin to identify as who he's called us to be healed, empowered, delivered, loved. Today, if you tell the world that you're a child of God and that they're a child of the devil, see what kind of reaction you get. The, the, the hard truth really is this. Those who are in Christ are children of the light. Those who are not in Christ are in darkness. You know, it's not politically correct to say that. And that will incense and inflame some people. More times than not, it's incensing and inflaming the devil that they cohabitate with than it does anything else. I heard Bill Johnson say this, humanity without the Holy Spirit is demonic. Humanity without the Holy Spirit is demonic. Guys, wishing that a revival would break out in Oklahoma City is not going to make it happen. Wishing that your friends make heaven is not going to make it happen. Wishing that your family gets right before God is not going to make it happen. Our silence may seal the deal that they never make it. Luke 4, 33. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, and he cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. I want to pause here for a second and just tell you some stuff just because of who you are. The enemy, when he knows he has to leave somebody, he would love to tear them, hurt them, rip them from the inside out and leave them damaged. But you have the ability as, as, as those endorsed by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to tell that enemy that he's got to go without harming them. You hear what I'm saying? Oh, I want to say this right. There are people that will allow the enemy to tear somebody on the way out for sensationalism for those that are watching. The whole point of deliverance is not so you can be the big deliverance preacher. The whole point of deliverance is to see people set free healed, mended, and restored, not damaged because you didn't stop it.
Again in verse 41, moreover demons came out of many people shouting, you're the son of God. And he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. Why, why do you suppose Jesus stopped them from telling that when it was the truth? Why did he stop them from telling other people who he was? He's already been accused of casting out devils because he was the prince of devils. You know, they, you can only cast the devils out because you're Beelzebub. And still the, the devil is saying, I know who you are. Did you come to get rid of us before our time? The devil knows the timeline of God. He, he, he knows revelations better than you and I do. He knows that the, the, the sands and the hourglass are just about gone. He knows that he has but a short time. We're the ones that live in ignorance and thinking, oh, well, whatever happens, happens. I believe one of the reasons that Jesus didn't let him speak was this. He was not going to allow any devil oh, to have any part in defining who he is. I, I don't need any devil to say, well, I know who you are. I don't care. I know who you are, and that's the point. Out! But we got people wearing badges. Uh, the devil called my name. It's not the devil I want calling my name. <laughs> it's God I want calling my name. The Father had already defined who Jesus is. The Father had already given Jesus his identity at his baptism. It's God's right to define who you and I are, not the enemy. Don't fall for the slick tongue of the enemy. Wow, I know you're really anointed. And I, I hope you really don't send me to hell right now and trying to absolutely just stroke your ego, make you think you're just somebody mighty. L listen, don't fall for those tricks. The enemy wants to define your identity. Can I say this too? Well, I'm going to anyway. Don't allow people who are used by the enemy to define who you are either. That's why Romans tells us, chapter 12, not to allow ourselves to be conformed to the world's mold but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Number four, how the devil challenges our identity in Christ. He begins with pointing out our past. Why do you think that at least twice a year I do a teaching on deliverance? Because in the six months between, I guarantee you the enemy has been dealing with some of you and some of the things that you've been set free from over time, he's been reintroducing into your life. And then telling you, listen, if you were really set free, you wouldn't have the appetite to even care that this stuff is around you. So you obviously still want it and really had nothing to do with you wanting it. It just had to do with the fact that he was on purpose putting it around you to make you think that you wanted it. You, you understand what I'm saying? So sometimes we need to be reminded that, listen, in the same way that Jesus knocks on our door, the enemy's knocking on our door because Jesus lives on the inside. He's saying, listen, why don't you just let me in there? So that's why we do the, the refresher about every six months or so and go back through this because I don't want anybody. Uh, can I just take a, take, take a moment as, as a pastor and brag on some of you right now? We went to that movie, Come Out in Jesus' Name. And at the end of the movie, Pastor Greg Locke comes out and says, okay, you've seen, you've seen the, the historical way that God has brought me through from a Baptist pastor to one who fully flows now in, in deliverance. Now, if, if you want freedom in Jesus, I want you to stand to your feet. And the whole theater that I was in stood to their feet. He started doing a mass deliverance. And people started manifesting all over, the, all over the theater. You want to know who was in the face of those that were manifesting? No excuses, people. You want to know why? Because they knew what to do. This is why we do what we do. Very validating, by the way, to see on the silver screen the things that's been taught from this house. Very validating. There was, a, there was a statement or two that literally I started crying in my chair because I thought I was the only one saying that as it related to deliverance and to hear other people, I just go, God, you did it! It was you all along! You see what I'm saying? It was very validating. And then to see you guys step up and not run from the ones that, oh, they're manifesting. You, you weren't running like that. You weren't freaking to go, oh my gosh, what do we do? I mean, you got after it. Why? 
because you've been doing it. You've, you've, been, you, you've been surrounded by it. You understand how it works, and it, it didn't freak you out. That's why we're going back. We don't know who's going to be the next theater. Some of y'all need to take some of your friends, bring some of your frenemies. The enemy wants to point out your past, some defining moments, major blunders, failed marriages, dishonorable acts, regrettable decisions. He wants to cause that memory to be on repeat in your heart and in your mind. See, if you don't know your Bible, if you don't know your word, then you don't understand that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. <laughs> it, did, it didn't say that it, it, it just all, doesn't always just keep us from all sin, though once you receive the Lord, he has the capacity to do that. But the blood was shed for the sinner. You guys didn't even hear none of that. The, the blood was shared not for the saints, but for the sinners. The blood of Jesus not only cleanses sin from the believer, but also the sinner. But if we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7, if, here's that crazy word again, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know what we want to do? We want to rewrite that. If we confess that we're in the light and choose not to walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And we got some nonsense like that coming from pulpits all over the world today. That's not what it says. Paul said, if, if they give you any other gospel than what I'm teaching and preaching, don't listen. Don't accept it. What does it say, 1 John 1, 7? If we walk day by day, walk in the light, Day by day, walk in the light. If we're walking in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You can't be cleansed from all sin if you're not going to walk with Jesus. Listen, do I believe that we should help the poor? Yes, absolutely. But when the poor make it an issue to guilt the church to give them what they say they need and they want nothing of the God that provided it to them through us I have a problem so what, whatever we sow whatever we give to the poor we do that with the hook of the gospel in it on purpose because he's the only reason that we're doing that in the first place you hear anything that I'm saying so if we're that way with those in need on the outside, you have to know that we're that way with the people that have a spiritual need on the inside. If you walk with God in the light as he is in the light, then we can fellowship. And then we know that our sins are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Not if I confess it and do what I want. I have to walk with him. People don't want to talk about that. They don't, they don't want, they, they, mm, let's find another scripture. Let's, let's twist it up a little bit because I don't want you then to tell me that in order to walk in the light that I got I to gotta say what Jesus says and do what Jesus does and go where he tells me to go and show up in the house, you know, and be faithful to the house of God. I, I, to, I don't want to be involved in all that stuff. I, listen, I want the benefits of a walk with Jesus without walking with Jesus. Just like people all over America wanting the benefits of a marriage without the marriage. They want the benefits of a fat bank account without having to work. I'm skipping. The devil is not authorized to define your identity. People love to throw Romans 8. Well, nothing can separate you from the love of God. That's absolutely true. And I have buried people that I love that I'm confident they're not with Jesus today. Doesn't mean I don't love them, but it also doesn't mean that they made heaven because I did. You guys hear what I'm saying? God's promise to us is that he loves us. His love for us does not guarantee us eternity with him. It has to be our decision to receive his love and to walk in the light as he is in the light.
don't care if you agree or not. Take it up with First John. First Peter 2, 9, and I'm drawing a close now. But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness, out of darkness, not called you so you can continue to live in darkness and claim to be in the light. He called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. John 15, 16, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and to bear fruit that will last. I want you to remember that we have access to the Father. Not because we find a loophole. We have access to the Father because it was His design for us to have access to the Father. I'm skipping. It really comes down to this today. Will you believe God when he tells you who you are? Or are you going to believe the accuser? Will you allow God to define your identity? Or will you allow the devil to do it? Can, can I tell you that, that a lot of people are running from God's defined identity for their life because they're afraid that if they receive the identity that God has for them, he's going to call them to Africa, you know, Philippines, somewhere out of the country, in deplorable conditions, and that's not their plan for them. They want God's plan for them as long as God's plan for them coincides with their plan for them. But I need you to understand that identity and, and calling are not necessarily synonymous. Your identity is who he has destined you to be. Your calling has to engage your obedience to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So don't miss the identity because you're afraid you're not going to be able to fulfill the plan. Receive the identity and allow him to work in your heart so that when your heart breaks, your will breaks, you don't even care about your will anymore. Now it's just about his will. So here's the, here's the bow. Three important steps to take in preventing identity theft. First, Know what the battle is about and don't let yourself buy into the suggestions of the accuser. What's the battle about? It's about you. It's about your destiny. It's about building the kingdom or not. Secondly, know what God has said about your identity. Know what the scripture says when it says it is written because the enemy is going to challenge what you think you know about you. This is what you need to know about you. And lastly, spend intentional time with the Lord. By yourself. Identity in this natural realm doesn't come when we drag somebody up in front of other people and say, this is brother, sister, so and so. Identity happens many times, one on one, over coffee or a meal, when you have a spiritual father or a spiritual mother that is investing wisdom, understanding, encouragement, 
uh, challenging belief systems, helping to shape and to mold the, th the thought processes and the heart condition of that individual and, per and, and person. That really is in the essence of what discipleship is. I've incensed a pastor or two in times past when I've told them, your church is an accurate reflection of who you are. They said, oh no, they're not. They're a bunch of hellions. I'm holy. They're not. And I, I, I don't say this to elevate myself or to elevate you, but it encourages me when I look around the room and I begin to see that there's a piece of me in you. But there's a piece of you in me. Because we can't hang out and not have influence on one another. And I'm proud of the influence that God has allowed me to have in your life. And I believe in the days ahead that that, that time and that influence is going to increase. See, some of y'all think this is about competition in Chile. <laughs> y'all are suckers. Y'all are so suckers. This, this, this was a way to get you to show up and to and rub off on other people and let other people rub off on you. This has nothing to do with who's got the best chili. We're we going to give out awards and we're going to make a big deal about it. We're going to have photo ops. It's going to be a lot of fun. But we tricked you. See, see, some of y'all wouldn't, wouldn't even show up to a men's event at all. Except I said, cook. Oh, bless God, I'll show them a thing or two. Get me in the kitchen, whoop something, blah, 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 blah. See, y'all thought it was all about your chili. Don't get me wrong, I'm going to enjoy your stuff. It's going to be good. I got Pepto. We're going to make it. But the point is that we come together. That's the point. I may even be talking to some people online today, but you've stood so many times to make confession. You didn't feel different. You didn't talk different. You didn't live different. You didn't know anything different. You know you want what God wants for you. But confession is as far as you've gotten. Because you never made the choice to live and walk in the light as he is in the light. That means I have to walk away from the things that were killing me and embrace the things that will give me life. I can't from the darkness have the right confession and expect that God is going to change everything in my life while I hang out in the darkness. God has called us out of the dark into the light. Quick soapbox moment. That's why we don't dim the lights when it comes to worship. If you've got to have a dark room to have the confidence to lift your hands, then you're not lifting your hands enough at home. If you have to have a dark room so the people don't know who's singing off key, then your focus is wrong because it's not on Jesus. It's on everybody around you. We worship in the light because he's in the light. I don't go to the darkness to worship him in the light. That may seem like a small thing to some of you. That is a ginormous thing to me. In fact, I want more lights in here. I'd love to have some LEDs right up the center here and just light this puppy up. Because, it, listen, our kids need to see us before God, not, what are they doing? When Rachel and I got married, we didn't get married in the dark so that nobody would see us. It was in the light. So everybody would see. We got people trying to pray private prayers so they could live a private life. When you surrender to Jesus, your life is no longer private. When you surrender to Jesus, you now belong to Him. 
And he's looking for lives that will display him openly. So I want to give a call today for those that don't yet know Jesus. But then I'm going to give a call to those that have made the commitment in times past to the Lord. But you've been fighting your identity. You've been believing the lies of the enemy. You've been believing stuff because you've got stuff in your history, in your past. And you've got things that have been messing with you. And the enemy's been harping on those. I want to see you get some freedom for that. But if you're here in the room today, Jesus at this moment, he's not the Lord of your life. He may have never been the Lord of your life. Or you, he may have been at one point and you walked away. Oh, I'm really stepping in it. I just hear some people, well, listen, I gave my heart to the Lord when I was a kid, so I, I'm safe. Watch this. If you can walk to Jesus, you can walk from Jesus. And if you walk from Jesus, please don't act like that you're still with him. Okay? So if you're here today, Jesus is not your Lord, but you want to invite him to be. I want you to stand right where you're at. I'm not counting. I'm not doing anything. If that's you, stand up right where you're at. You got about five seconds, and then we're moving on. This has to be your choice. Well, home folk, come on, Marie. Come on with it. Come on. Anybody else? Takes guts to be the only one, especially in a loud hat like yours. Come on. <laughs> Give me two or three ladies here. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. If we were here just by ourselves, I would just have one of them lead her to the Lord. In fact, it's time. Jackie, your turn. Lead her to Jesus. For those of you watching online, thank you so very much for joining with us. We'd love to see you here at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. No Easter Bunny, no eggs this coming Sunday. We will be having some pinatas and a lot of fun. But the, the guest of honor is not a rabbit, it's Jesus. And we'd love to see you come out and hang out with us for that deal. So until this coming Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or Thursday at 6.45 p.m., God bless you. Have an incredible weekend.